I'm a um, social neuroscientist, and what I want to tell you is how we actually approached, uh, in our way as psychologists and neuroscientists, how to tackle global problems by mental training, by changing inside and not you know, changing laws or institutions. So um, the problems we you know, are concerned is on the macro scopic level, of course, you have heard a lot about climate change, depletion of resources in our Earth, poverty in the middle of plenty, but also on the subjective, personal level, we have this kind of epidemic. So we have an increase in stress-related diseases, we have an increase in depression already in very young people, children, and we have also an epidemic in subjective loneliness. That means that we are enormously coupled to internet, but people feel increasingly decoupled in a very strange way. And this kind of feeling of loneliness actually are not just some kind of subjective stuff. It predicts how early you will die and all kinds of diseases. Um, so how can we actually bring social cohesion back into our world? How can we increase what has always been called soft skills, but which actually are hardcore skills. <laughs> you will see they are wired in our brain, and they are very hardcore skills like empathy, compassion, perspective taking, cooperation, uh, so that we can achieve global cooperation, sustainability, more well-being, less stress, and I'm presenting you very shortly data of a study where we put 300 people, like you and me, um, through a one-year mental training program. And um, this was funded also by the European Research Council, Max Planck Institute. So this is how it looks like. They are like these different cohorts, and they undergo three modules, three mental training modules of different types of mental training. So what I really want you to get is, you know, there is a huge hype around mindfulness and meditation right now. Lots of apps designed and so on. It's a bit like if you would say sports as a general, you know, kind of construct, sport, you know. Of course, the effects of sport will depend on whether you're doing riding or whether you are doing running or chess playing. The same is true for our mind. It is extremely complex and depending on what you cultivate every day, meditation is nothing else than cultivating your mind and heart and body. <laughs> so as a loop anyway. Um, Depending on what you practice, you will have different outcomes. And I'll show you um, the outcomes. So the first three months, people basically learned how to get a stable mind, how to bring the attention into the present moment and not always being thinking about the past, the future, but just being now, here. So that's what the most of the apps which are out there are training, the mindfulness attention-based practice. Now the modules which are coded in red, and the data will also be coded in the same color, this is a compassion and emotionally based module. So what you learn here is mental practices which really tag your caring emotional system. So you're learning how to deal with difficult emotions, stress, anger, uh, sadness, frustration, but also how to develop compassion, gratitude, and other positive emotions. And in the third module, the green one, this is more cognitive, is a metacognitive module. And what you learn here is to get an observer of who you are, of your own thoughts, and of other people's beliefs. I'll come to that later. So what we did is 80 people of one cohort went into three-day retreat together to learn these kind of core practices. And then we had 17 teacher and an app and the app was supporting the mental training of a given module every day. So every day you could get in your app, have your teacher, and do the practice of 30 minutes. And this is the model. So you had these two core exercises for each of the three months models. And what you see here, perhaps one thing I want to point your attention on, we didn't have only, you know, these classical mental training where you close your eyes, you know, like on all this newspaper and you do this kind of internal uh, calming your mind, mindfulness. But we also had intersubjective social exercises of 10 minutes 
where people would call up other people. You would call up, if you would be like part of the study, uh, one person you don't know, 10 minutes every day for a week, and you would exercise things like non-judgmental listening, empathic listening, perspective taking on beliefs of others, and the other one, and then you would change. It's only 10 minutes, but very, very effectful exercise. So this is the app. So either for your practice alone, this is how the app would look if you do these dyadic partner exercises. You basically are linked with one person, you know, like you draw the image in, and then you have a, an app which completely tells you which question to ask, when to, when you change, and so on. Uh, so we could also, you know, like that's a picture of the participants when they were in holidays, so we could track whatever they would, how much they would uh, actually practice. And then we had 90 different measures. So we really ask, how does such mental training affect the brain, the body, the immune system, the behavior, cooperation, a vast amount of different data. Now, perhaps one word why we kind of have these two modules, what is called affect and perspective, you know, the kind of socio-emotional affective compassion module and the more cognitive bird's eye perspective module. Why you need both is because we know from neuroscience that there are two different networks in the brain subserving on one hand social emotions like empathy and compassion, and that's like the ability, empathy is the ability to resonate with the feelings of others, to feel when someone is suffering, to feel for someone is compassion. But the green pathway, the, which is also the green module, is a more cognitive pathway, and that's the ability to understand that other people might have other beliefs than you are holding. And that's super important, perspective taking, because you, for co cross-cultural conflicts, for every kind of conflict, you need the ability to know why a person would basically act in a strange way you condemn. And for that, you need to take the perspective of the mind of another person. It's kind of a mind-reading ability. You need to understand that you might have holding very clear beliefs which might be different in another person of a different religion, different state, different cultural background. And if you don't do this, and even many adults are not very good in that, <laughs> they're like hanging in their own, I know, um, then you will have conflicts and it's very hard to resolve conflicts. Because this compassion-based, more emotional care network is very good to motivate altruism and compassion, but it's not good to do this kind of if you don't like a person. It's very difficult to feel compassion if someone has harmed you. So you need these two capacities. And when we scan that in the brain, you see this person lying in the brain scanner, you see two different networks which are underlying this capacity for this kind of more cognitive perspective taken in green and compassion and empathy, these kind of social uh, soft skills in red. So did this training work? And which of the three modules is actually best in increasing empathy and compassion on one hand and this perspective-taking ability on the other? So what we found is that, and that was surprising, you don't see any yellow here. So three months of attention-based mindfulness practice is really good for increasing attention and increasing present moment focus, but it's actually not very efficient for compassion. You need these explicit practices in the compassion-based module to increase compassion. And you find uh, also a similar kind of specific effect for social intelligence. So neither the mindfulness module nor the compassion module is able to increase this capacity of getting a better you know, mind reader. But the perspective-taking exercise you do every day, 10 minutes with the other person, increases the social intelligence score. So when you look in the brain, you see the same specificity. And that was quite astonishing because, you know, I don't know, I was raised as a neuroscience in a time when I studied. People told me, with 25, 
your brain gets thinner and thinner and you have age-related decline, but you certainly are not growing your brain anymore. <laughs> you have no gray matter increase in thickness anymore. And what I show you here is data which show thickness increases in the hardware of your brain and the gray matter after three minutes of training. So in yellow, you see the increases in thickness in your brain after three months of attention-based training. In the same brains you see after three months of compassion-based training, another increases in the red areas. And then after three months of perspective, yet another network gets better and increases in thickness. And this predicts also behavior. So the good news is because these people were like 43 years in average. They are not the youngsters, the kids. You know, of course, the kids are super plastic. But even old dogs like me and you, I don't know, you're probably rather more younger. But um, we can still, you know, change the hardware of our brain and that will influence the behavior. We also ask whether we can reduce social stress, because social stress is a huge disease in our modern world. And how you measure social stress is by having cortisol measured when someone has to give a talk about being the best person for Max Planck. And these white uh, coat people, they are trained, instead of giving social cues and laughing and be nice, they do like... Ooh. So they give these negative social cues. And that really brings up cortisol's social stress response because humans hate being judged by others and feeling not good enough and feeling like, uh, you know, below um, the possibilities. So what we now wanted to know is three months mindfulness attention-based practice enough to reduce this kind of social stress? Or do we need these social modules, compassion and perspective taking, where you really have intersubjective practice of how I am relating to others. And the answer is very clear. Three months of attention-based mindfulness practice did not do a thing on the level of hormonal cortisol social stress. However, we had a huge decrease in social stress response on the cortisol level if you look at these social modules, compassion, and perspective taking, where you have like every day you train how not to fear anymore, to be judged by others so much. So I skipped this data, this just means on the subjective level you find something like that. And come to the question of whether this training can also increase cooperation and altruism. So we had in this study 14 different measures, among measures also which behavioral economists are using to measure things like trust, donation behavior, cooperation on a global scale, uh, you know, like altruistic punishment when someone is unfair. So these data relate basically to economic theories and economic behavior and decision making. And we had one factor where you could say if people in this factor are high, we call it altruistic motivated behavior. They basically give a lot of money to donation. They trust people more. They are just inherently generous. So it's not this kind of pro-social behavior which you do because people look at you and you want to, you know, like image scoring or because someone has helped you before, what we call reciprocity, and then you give back. This is really like this pure altruistic generosity of just giving out to the world. So here again was the question, which type of mental training is actually best in boosting that? And the answer was very clear as well. Even though mindfulness attention practice a little bit, but not significant, the compassion-based module, whether you did it three months, after six months or nine months, really boosted your altruistic cooperative behavior. And that is very strange if you show this to economists, they will like, really don't like this data because they think that preferences are fixed. Either you are born as an egoist or an altruist, but you can change in 30 minutes a day of mental training, which is super cheap, your preferences. So this is kind of revolutionary for all neoclassicistic economic models and really have you know, led a lot of economists to rethink whether their model are really right. So in summary, 
I hope that I could first give you the, the main message, good news, that we can kind of just turning inwards instead of always just checking outwards what is there, just turning your attention inwards, cultivating mind and heart, you can change your system on many levels. Subjective, the brain, your health, stress, behavior, I mean, it's like huge. And I hope that I have also convinced you that we shouldn't think about meditation or mindfulness as one concept or thing or thing, but that you have these fingerprints of it really matters what you practice, like in sport. If you concentrate on attention, your attention will become better. If you concentrate on the qualities of care, of the heart, of emotions, you will become more altruistic, more cooperative, more compassionate. If you practice cognitive perspective taking, like a bird's perspective on your brain and on others, you become more socially intelligent. But you don't necessarily have the motivation to act for that. You need combustion training. So I would say all together would be a perfect mix. And I showed you that you can change the heart the, the, the hard wiring of your brain, that you can reduce social stress and even increase your body. Sometimes this takes time, and because of these scientifically you know, validated findings, we feel that these kind of mental practices should enter all kinds of streams in society, from businesses to education to the healthcare system, because the burnout rates are immense, and these practices can increase your resilience and buffer a lot of detrimental effects of social stress and um, not coping with suffering of others. So thank you very much, and have a great day. <laughs> Go ahead and stay on stage with us for we a second. A We're going to ask one question. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Tanya, so much. Uh, so the question from Slido, and you can participate in questions by going to slido.com and entering TOA19 or in your TOA app. And the question is, is there research into how changes into individuals like this ties to societal change? So how do the people changing uh, individually affect the whole for all of, of us? I mean, you know, I think this answer we have discussed a huge amount because I'm working also on models of caring economics with economists. You need both. You need internal change and you need institutional, ch institutional design and change, which are congruent to the values you want to put in your... So there are many studies now, for example, showing that these kind of programs put into education can actually have really positive effects on, you know, less burnout rates for teachers, happier children, <laughs> less bullying in the classroom. So these studies emerge. There are studies in business contexts also emerging, showing also stress reduction, more cooperation. But there will, that will be the next step of research, is to do a lot of field research, and that comes basically back to the second question. Are you planning to scale this project and involve more people? The answer is yes. So we're planning to bring this research out of the lab into the society and see how that can be beneficial in the different sectors of business, of work environment, of schools, of health systems. So Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, and